Russian archaeologist Sergei Solovyov heads out to explore an eerie fortification that dates back almost 200 years. At the start of the 19th century, they needed to create modern defensive structures to protect St. Petersburg. The deep waters of the Gulf of Finland have long left Russia open to attack. At one end is Russia's old capital city of St. Petersburg, and at the opposite end are Europe's other great powers, France, Germany, Britain. And by the 1830s, the Russians needed to build a new fort in the Gulf itself to keep their capital safe. They had to create a complete artificial island to accommodate this defensive structure. Building an island, then the fort on top, took seven years. The result was the distinctively designed Fort Alexander. Both Russian and European military forces considered it to be an impregnable stronghold with powerful artillery. There were 103 guns in the casemates and 34 on the top layer, which is open. Military ships of the time couldn't breach these defences. But the guns of the Tsar's imperious fortress would never fire a single shot in battle. Because, by 1845, soon after its completion, Fort Alexander had become redundant. Military weaponry was becoming so powerful that the fort's walls could no longer withstand an enemy shelling. But decades later, the fort did see action when Russia was attacked by an enemy far more deadly than any navy. In the late 19th century, a pandemic of the bubonic plague was spreading across the world. The plague had already ravaged parts of the globe twice before, in the 6th century and in the 14th century. This disease spread from country to country through different ports. At every port, rats would escape from the ships, but it was really their fleas that spread the disease. And by the 1890s, with the growth of international trade, the so-called third plague pandemic was reaching its peak. It had already reached parts of Europe and was now knocking on Russia's door. The Russian government was aware of the importance of controlling the pandemic because of the outbreaks in China and India near Russia's borders. The Russian government decides they're going to study the disease in a lab, have lots of scientists working with samples, trying to find a vaccine. And of course, they had the perfect place to do it. The isolated artificial island of Fort Alexander, with its high-level security, was about to come into its own. In 1897, this place was chosen to accommodate the Plague Research Laboratory. The mighty fort had to be repurposed to contain the unseen enemy inside its walls. When the laboratory was created, the fort was divided into two parts. The right part was for infectious work, the left part was kept clean. Within the infectious side of the fort, the laboratory setup was scrupulous. The laboratory was equipped with the latest technology. There was steam heating, gas and electric supplies, designated research areas and staff rooms. The labs and their operation were pretty sophisticated for the time, and they had, you know, vials, test tubes, lab coats. The first floor of the fort had a series of laboratory facilities, libraries, conference rooms, and something surprising. 
This room was most probably used as a stable for horses. Rodents, monkeys and reindeer were also used for trials here. They brought in animals to this fort so that they could infect them with the plague. There are photographs of how they'd perform autopsies on the animals, pinning their legs back with wires. It's gruesome stuff. The laboratories extended to the fort's second floor. They experimented with different types of the disease. They even made a dust that could be inhaled. And in other instances, they simply injected the specimen into animals' windpipes. It was only a matter of time before something went wrong. In an abandoned fort turned into a plague laboratory, 19th century Russian scientists were carrying out experiments that could cost them their lives. With all the lab's sophistication, they still couldn't completely remove the possibility of the disease escaping. The site reveals how the scientists use the isolation of the fort's upper level to deal with the unthinkable. We're now on the third floor of the fort, where an infirmary was set up in case any of the staff became infected with the plague. Despite stringent safety measures, they had to use this isolation unit at the start of 1904, when the plague laboratory's head doctor contracted the plague and died. Three years later, the disease escaped again. This time, the esteemed epidemiologist Liev Podlievsky and his friend and colleague Dr. Schreiber were on the front line. When Schreiber developed symptoms of the plague, Dr. Podlievsky rushed him up to the dreaded third floor. This is where Dr. Schreiber came when he fell ill. He died within three days and, with the body still contagious, Dr. Podlievsky had to perform the autopsy. Shortly after the post-mortem of his colleague, Dr. Podlevsky started to feel a burning sensation in his fingers. But the researchers' sacrifices were about to pay off. Things looked grim for Dr. Podlevsky, but his colleagues started administering some of the antidotes they'd been working on. And in a few days, it looked like they were starting to work. Podlievsky and the other scientists had developed a cure. He'd been given the anti-plague serum, developed here in this laboratory. Within about 10 or 12 days, he started to feel better. And he eventually recovered. It was very fortunate that Dr. Podlievsky could be cured. As well as finding an antidote to the plague, the fort scientists also worked successfully on diseases such as tetanus, typhoid, and cholera. But in 1917, the Russian Revolution brought the work of the imperialist plague laboratory to an end. With the antidote inaccessible to most, the third plague pandemic lived on for the next four decades, claiming 15 million lives before petering out in 1959.